I who speak to you am he. This is perhaps actually one of the more curious episodes recounted in the Gospels. The text explains that Jews do not have dealings with Samaritans. According to social standards, Jesus shouldn't be talking to a Samaritan or asking anything from her. But more than that, this woman shouldn't be here. It is the sixth hour, that is noon. Now, a gallon of water weighs a little more than eight pounds. A gallon may seem like a lot if you're drinking it by yourself, but when you add cooking, cleaning, animals, family members, it just doesn't go very far. The average American uses 80 to 100 gallons just indoors every day. Ancient people would use less, but it would still be no small amount, especially when you have a whole family. So if you take the pottery equivalent of your five-gallon bucket and fill it with water, that would be an over 40-pound jar, and that size would still require numerous trips. High noon is certainly not the time you want to be doing that kind of work. But this woman is here in the middle of the day, and she's all alone. This woman is an outcast. She is here when no one wants to draw water, because no one wants her around. And seeing as she's on man number six, it's no surprise why the other women in town don't much like her. But before we get to that, there is someone who wants to see her. Jesus Christ, the all-knowing God, is waiting for her. He is weary from the journey, but he went 40 days without food or water in the wilderness before his temptation. He could have gone the rest of the way into town, but instead he stops here, where he knows this woman will be coming. And so a sinful Samaritan woman comes at an hour she shouldn't to meet a Jewish man who shouldn't want to have anything to do with her. You don't need to be a detective to know something strange is happening. But then again, if God was going to do things the way we thought they should be done, sending his only begotten son to die on the cross to take away the sins of the world, certainly would have never made the list. So thanks be to God, he doesn't follow our plans. Jesus asks her for a drink. He's at a well and doesn't have anything to draw water. He's been on a long journey. If he wasn't talking to a Samaritan woman, this would be entirely unremarkable. Traveling by foot is long and tiring, and dusty. This is perfectly normal behavior for a traveler to ask a local person for a drink. And the proper response, of course, is to give them water. You won't find a commandment anywhere in the Bible that says, you shall give water to thirsty strangers who happen to come by your well. But the Bible is full of commands to be kind to strangers, to take care of the needy and those in distress. Any Jewish or Samaritan equivalent of a confirmation student would easily know the correct answer is to give the person water. It's not a difficult question. But this woman says, wait a minute, you're a Jew? We've been fighting for over 500 years. I thought you weren't supposed to want anything from me. I thought you'd rather be thirsty than ask for my help. But Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said, Sir, 
You have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus doesn't say, I'm just that thirsty. He doesn't say, this fighting is no reason not to interact with each other. Instead, he says, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for better water. Now, we hear living water and think faith, life, forgiveness of sins, the word of God. But this woman hears it and thinks of flowing water, water that flowed instead of just sitting in a lake or pond, was called living water in those days. So she thinks that Jesus is saying he can find flowing water right here in this well that doesn't have it. Now, there are three types of water, or of wells in the Bible, because the word really just means hole in the ground with water in it. The first is a cistern. Dig a hole, put some steps in it, plaster it up so it doesn't leak, wait for the rain to fall. It works, it gives you water, but any of you who've had to take care of a pool or a cistern knows it doesn't always stay nice and clean, does it? It also evaporates away, which really isn't something you want your well to do. The second is more of what we think of with a well. It's a hole in the ground, and you put steps or a rope in it, and you go down and get water from an underground pool. It's filtered through rocks, so it's cleaner, probably tastes better, more reliable, because it's the groundwater. But the third type, you make that hole and you go down to an underground river. This is the best kind, fresh, cool, flowing water. Generally gonna taste better than anything else, and be the most reliable option. So this woman is thinking, Jesus just said he can go down into this well, this deep well, and bring up better water than Jacob found right there in the same spot, even though he doesn't have anything to hold water. Unlike you, this offer of living water went completely over this woman's head. And so Jesus continues on. He doesn't say, of course I'm greater than your father Jacob. Instead he says, no, not just tastier water or fresher water, better water. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. This is a deal. One drink of water and you're good to go. You don't need any more. No more being thirsty. No more going out of town on the journey to the well to bring back lots of heavy water and repeat this trip many times during the day. No. One drink and you're good to go. Sign me up. Apparently, this woman was too excited about this very good deal. She missed that whole eternal life part. But hey, if people could hear it once and get the entire message the first time, the Bible would be a whole lot shorter Every meeting you've ever sat through would have taken a quarter of the time, and a bureaucracy might actually run something efficiently. But our sinful ears don't listen well to what we need to hear, whether it comes from God or from our neighbors. So Jesus, in his mercy, continues on leading this woman to understand and believe. And so Jesus says, go call your husband and come here. 
this woman wants to never have to come to this well again. And hey, if you didn't have indoor plumbing, you'd be very excited about the idea too. So Jesus tells her to go get her husband. If he needs water, she's going to have to come here and get it. So might as well get everyone and get it done all at once so you actually solve the water needs once and for all. But the woman answered him, I have no husband. And now she is trapped. She did not get the message the first two times as sin-hardened ears so often miss it. But now the hole in her armor is exposed and Jesus strikes the winning blow. He said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Jesus lays out this woman's sins. She is a serial adulteress. She is on man number six, and this time they didn't even bother getting married. A well-known fact throughout her town, but a stranger can't know this. That requires the power of God. And so this woman throws up her hand in the air and acknowledges Jesus as a prophet. Now when you think of prophet, there's a long list throughout the Old Testament. But Samaritans only recognized the Pentateuch, that is, the first five books of the Bible written by Moses. And so they only have one great prophet, Moses himself. And he says in Deuteronomy, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. As Peter and Stephen make clear twice in Acts, this is a prophecy of the coming Christ. He is the prophet who is not only like Moses, but far greater even than Moses himself. Not all the Samaritans recognize this, but they know that the coming prophet is an incredibly important man sent by God. And so by calling Jesus a prophet, this woman is coming much closer than she realizes to understanding who she is speaking to. She knows that if he is not at the top of the list, he's very, very close. And so she asks him her most pressing question, where should we worship? This is not a minor question as it might seem today. This is actually at the heart of the faith. The Pentateuch commands to worship and sacrifice in one place, which God will tell them. And this moved about throughout Israel for many years, but then 2 Samuel specifies the place will be Jerusalem and will stay there. But the Samaritan Pentateuch is different. It was changed to say not the place where the Lord will designate, but Mount Gerizim is the place where you shall sacrifice. And so, this woman isn't just asking Jesus which street corner is the best place for a church. She's really asking, who has the correct Bible? Who's sinning? Who are the true believers? And Jesus answers in just a few verses, some things which could fill thousands and thousands of books and hours and days of sermons, which don't worry, we won't go into. Jesus says ever so briefly, Samaritans worship the true God, but are mistaken. Jews worship that very same God, but no better. This alone is a marvelous declaration it answers the question at the heart of the fighting that's been going on for 500 years and acknowledges both groups as believers. Yet Jesus adds more and better. 
The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This requires not just a change of location for the altar, but an end to the sacrifices and an abolition of the altar. Worship in spirit and truth means that that worship is not by the means of the blood of goats and calves. And if those sacrifices then are ended, that requires a final and perfect sacrifice, which doesn't need to be repeated, which actually covers those sins that daily and monthly and yearly they sacrificed animals to cover over. This is a monumental and seismic change. Now this woman probably didn't understand all even of that brief summary any more than any of us understood the full depths of this passage the first time we read it. However, she did understand that this was big. This was a very big deal. It required the very top. We don't know what this woman understood about the relationship between the prophet who was to come and the Messiah. But she knows for certain that the Messiah is the one they've been waiting for. She knows he's the fulfillment of all of God's promises. And so she mentions the Messiah. Because to ask if the Messiah had come to her, a woman who was not only a Samaritan, but a notorious sinner, was a thought too wonderful to even speak of. But this great and wonderful miracle was true. For Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And as with Zacchaeus and countless other tax collectors and sinners, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so salvation came to the house of this woman, who was a daughter of Abraham, not merely by flesh and blood, but now by that very same faith which Abraham had. We do not that now get some made-for-television story about the woman turning her life around, though since we know that no one can serve two masters, this woman certainly repented of her long-standing sins, even if it was a long and hard process to turn away from that slavery to sin, to obedience to God. And what is more, if we had more time, you would hear in the following verses that this woman believed, and so she went back to her town to tell everyone what had happened, that the Messiah had come, and they came out, and likewise believed. Truly, this woman and many from her town received the water of eternal life. She drank of what Jesus offered, and that living water brought them faith and the forgiveness of sins. And as you learned in confirmation, where there is the forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Praise be to Christ who gives that blessed spring, which forgiveness and life eternal bring. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.